But I think the issue of segregated audiences now is, uh, as we find throughout American society, it, it, to the extent that it's segregated, it is not um, by law, it's by choice. And so you can have theaters that cater to um, black audiences, such as the Greenbrier Mall, Magic Johnson theaters. But you go to any mall in this city and you're going to see a mix of patrons at, you know, the AMC Multiplex or the Regal Theater at Atlantic Station. Um, so it, it's really quite mixed up now, and, and that's a good thing. Although there is still, you know, these places where you can talk about a separate audience. It's not segregated by law from above. It's just by choice or location. Mm -hmm. The black exploitation movement, which you generally date from 71 and Sweet Sweetback, that shows Hollywood starting to pay attention. Again, Sweetback was not made in Hollywood. It was made by Van Peebles outside of Hollywood. He had worked in Hollywood previously, but this was his own project. Mm -hmm. And then Shaft comes along, and Shaft was actually conceived as being for a white character and someone decided somewhere along the line to make him a black character and got this handsome model, Richard Roundtree, to play the character. And we were off to the races, and you had sequels to Shaft, and so forth. These are not <clears throat> the first black films uh, produced in Hollywood. Uh, you have things like Cotton Comes to Harlem. You have um, um, Gordon Parks as The Learning Tree, an adaptation of his autobiographical novel about growing up black in um, rural Kentucky in 1969. So you, you have these isolated instances along the way, but it's really black exploitation that really focuses on appealing to the black audience. And again, it was because Hollywood was seeing its white audience decline. Mm -hmm. And um, that period from the late 60s to the early 1970s is one in which Hollywood is trying to figure out how to make money uh, because Big budget musicals are flopping long after Sound of Music. And um, Hollywood's trying all kinds of things. They're letting um, Dennis Hopper direct Easy Rider. Um, they're letting young directors get their start, Coppola, Scorsese. And black exploitation is one other way they try to expand the appeal and range of their audiences. Selznick in Gone with the Wind, where he actively talks about trying to promote the film and show it in black neighborhoods. And it premiered in Atlanta in December of 1939. It came to the Bailey's Royal in June of 1940. But that was also because it had a major distribution program, road showing, advanced ticket sales, and so forth. So it was, it was delayed more than the usual uh, clearance between a white theater and a black theater, but that was because of the nature of it as a special event mm -hmm. film. Um, but really, black exploitation is the time. I mean, the, the popularity of Sidney Poitier was an exception that proved the rule. We primarily appeal to white audiences. Hollywood is very careful in what it shows. You take a film like The Defiant Ones, where he and Tony Curtis are chained together, running through the South, and don't like each other, but learn to get along. Their only way they're going to survive is if they get along. You know, that's a film primarily aimed at white audiences. If you read James Baldwin's great essay, The Devil Finds Work, you will read about the outrage that he and other black viewers felt when at the end Sidney Poitier has broken free, is on the train, he's going to get away, and he reaches out his hand to Tony Curtis, and Tony Curtis can't keep up with him, and he gets off the train and cradles Tony Curtis in his arms as the sheriff approaches, so actually chooses to go back to prison with his white buddy rather than escape to freedom, and just how utterly incongruous that was. But what was also quite interesting was that Selznick was quite eager to please Atlantans and Georgians. Uh, the night of the premiere, before he went into the theater, he said, you know, if Atlanta likes the movie, then we're, we're good. But if Atlanta doesn't like it, we're in trouble. And he was very aware of the need to uh, please Southerners with the film. And that dynamic of trying to please them in a certain sense. Any filmmaker wants to please the audience, wants to make sure the audience will buy tickets. On the other hand, he was responding to the great sensitivity that Atlantans and Georgians were showing. They would not hesitate to write him and tell him who should be cast as Scarlett O'Hara. There was one woman, I found a letter in Selznick's correspondence, who even offered her house as one of the plantation sites 
And the reason she was keen to offer it was that she wanted to sell it, and she thought she'd get a lot of offers if it played the role of Tara in the film. So he was constantly hearing from Atlantans and Georgians about the film and how it should be made. Um, Margaret Mitchell once wrote, it's as if it, Atlantans feel like the film belongs to them, and not that Selznick has bought the rights to make the film. Selznick wrestled with this. This was not an easy decision for him. And one of the things that made it difficult for him was that before the premiere, he got a letter from the head of the student theater group at um, Clark Atlanta University, uh, inviting him to come and speak to the theater troupe. And this letter read something like, we are as much your fans and the film's fans as all the white people in Atlanta, so you should really come and give us some of your time. And um, Selznick wrote back and said, yeah, I'll think about it. But of course he wasn't going to do it. But it did make him rethink the whole issue of what to do about Hattie McDaniel. But in the end, they decided to play it safe. And I think it's safe to say they were all overwhelmed by the reception they got here in Atlanta.